Alright, welcome back everybody. This is part 5 of 5 in the Priority Queue series, and we're going to have a look at some source code for the Priority Queue today. So if you want the source code, here's a GitHub link with all the data structures in the series. The Priority Queue is one of them. Also make sure you've watched parts 1 to 4 so you can actually understand what's going on. Alright, let's dive into the code. All right, here we are inside the source code. So notice that inside my priority queue, the types of elements I'm allowing inside my priority queue have to be comparable elements, as we talked about. So if they implement the comparable interface, then we are going to allow them inside our queue. So this is anything like strings, integers, anything with a comparable interface. So let's have a look at some of the instance variables. So I have the heap size, so this is the number of elements currently inside the heap. But then I also have another instance variable, which is the heap capacity. So this is going to be the size of the list that we have for our elements, which may be larger than uh, the heap size is. And this is the actual heap, and we're going to be maintaining it as a dynamic list of elements using Java's list. Next, for our uh, log of n removals, I'm also going to keep track of this map. And it's going to map an element to a tree set of integers. So these are going to be all the positions inside our heap which we can find this element t. Alright. Next, I've got a few different constructors for our priority queue. Uh, we can just create a priority queue, and by default, I'm creating an initially empty priority queue with a capacity of 1. But I also allow you to create a priority queue with a defined initial capacity, which actually is more useful, because then we don't have to keep expanding our dynamic list every time. So I would recommend this. But also, even better, is if you know all the elements that are going to be inside your heap, you can actually construct the, the priority queue in linear time using an operation called heapify, which I didn't talk about in the slides, but, but can be very, very useful. So, so this just has all the usual setup stuff. Um, here I'm adding all the elements to the map, but also to the heap. And then here's the heapify process. So we start at um, about halfway through the heap size, and then we start decreasing, and then we sync all the elements. And you're like, wait a second, isn't the seek, uh, sync a logarithmic removal? Well, yes it is in the general case, but not if we're doing it in this fashion. Um, I put a link to this paper up here just because uh, the heapify operation isn't quite intuitive why it has this uh, linear complexity. And if you look at the analysis in the paper, you, you'll end up seeing that um, the complexity boils down to a convergent series, and that's why we get a constant and can say it's uh, linear time. But in general, this isn't what you might be tempted to do if you're giving a collection of elements. Um, you would initialize the heap, and then you would just use our add method to add the elements one at a time. And this will give you an end log and bound. But uh, definitely use the heapify whenever possible. Okay, now some pretty simple methods. We have is empty, just returns true or false if the heap is empty or not. Then, uh, clear, so when we clear the heap, we remove all the elements inside our heap array, but also inside our uh, map. So that's why I call map.clear. Size returns a size, it's pretty simple. Um, peak, the first really useful method, just looks at the top of our uh, priority, priority queue. And if it's empty, returns null, otherwise, we do a lookup at the first index inside our uh, heap and return it because it's the root node. 
pole. Uh, similar to peak, except that we're going to uh, re remove the very first element, and we're also going to return it because we want that information. Next contains. So because we have a map with all our elements, we can do a uh, map lookup to see if our elements inside the heap. And this reduces our complexity from uh, linear, in which case we have to scan, do a linear scan through all the elements to check containment, to constant time, which is remarkable. Um, but in the general case, people don't usually maintain this map. I, I just wanted to do it just to show you guys that it is possible. Although the map does add a lot of constant overhead you may or may not want. Um, I personally find that the overhead is quite a lot and I usually don't really remove things very frequently from maps so it might not be entirely worth it but it's up to you. If you're doing as many additions as you are uh, removals then definitely worth it. Alright, now let's have a look at the add method. Uh, so, so this element, sorry, this method adds an element to the prior queue, and that element cannot be null. So what we do is, first we check if um, our heap size is less than capacity. Otherwise, we have to uh, expand our capacity of the heap. Next, we make sure we add it to the map, so we keep track of it, and then we uh, swim it up. Remember that we have to swim a node up because we add it to the very end of our list, and so we have to like adjust where it goes inside our heap by swimming upwards. This next method called less is, is a helper method which helps me check if node i is less than or equal to node j, and this uses the fact that both elements, node 1 and node 2, are comparable, so we can invoke the compare to method. Um, if we go back up, that comes from this interface, the comparable interface, which we needed. So let's scroll back down. All right. So it returns true if i is less than or equal to j. Awesome. So next, this is the bottom-up node swim. So we are going to try to swim node k. So first we grab the parent of node k, and we can do that by uh, solving for the parent. So remember that I am working in... Uh, I'm starting at 0. Some people like to start their heaps indexed at 1. I like everything 0 based. So I get the parent, um, which is at this position, k minus 1 divided by 2, because we're going upwards. And uh, while k is still greater than 0, so we're not at the root, and we are less than our parent, then we want to swim upwards. So we're going to swap the nodes, parent and k, and then k is going to become the new parent. And then we have to get the parent of k once more. And then we keep doing this, going uh, up our heap and swapping nodes. So that's how we do the swim. So the sync is similar, but a little different. So this is a top-down node sync. And here we want to sync node k. And what we do is I grab the left node, but I also grab the right node. Remember, we're working zero-based, so plus one, plus two, instead of um, plus zero and plus one. And then I need to figure out which is uh, less. Either it's going to be the left one or the right one. And I assume to start with that the left one is going to be smaller than the right one. And here I correct that hypothesis in case it was false. So I check that uh, the right node is within the size of the heap, and if the right node is less than the left node, then the smallest one is going to be the right node. 
and our stopping condition is that uh, we are outside the bounds of the tree or we can't sink any more. And we kind of do a similar thing, we swap and then k is the next smallest, kind of like, like we did in um, uh, the last method also. So the swap method, I, I made a, an explicit method to swap because I also have to uh, swap things inside the map and then uh, set the values also. Um, and this is really what adds a lot of the overhead for the map is the fact that every time we call the swap method we also have to swap things inside the map which which can be a lot of overhead really. It, technically maps are constant lookup times but the fact that you're doing all this internal hashing and and collisions and whatnot, it, it can get costly. So remove. So if the element is null, uh, return false. We know we don't have any null elements inside our heap. So this is how you would do a uh, linear removal in linear time. I commented out in case you want to revert back and remove the map and whatnot. Uh, is you would scan through all the elements, and once you find the element you were looking for, um, just remove it at that index and return true. Otherwise, uh, we're going to use our map. So get the index of wherever the element, one of the elements are, um, and if it exists, then remove it at that index. Okay, now let's have a look at the remove at method. So this is what I covered in the last video. So if our heap is empty, well, can't really remove anything. Otherwise, we're going to swap the index of what we want to remove with the last element, which is going to be at uh, heap size. And then we're going to kill off uh, that node and also remove it from our map. So if it so happened that uh, i was equal to the heap size, meaning we just removed the, the very last element in our heap, just remove, uh, return the removed data. Otherwise, when we did the swap, we have to either sync that node up or down. And uh, I'm kind of too lazy to check whether I need to sync or swim. So I just try both. So first I try syncing, and then uh, if nothing happened, then I, I try uh, swimming downwards. And in either case, return the removed data. Perfect. So this just readjusts where, um, where the swap node position goes, either bubble up or bubble down. This method is just a, a method I use in my testing framework to make sure everything is uh, good. So it checks essentially the integrity of the minimum heap. So initially you call this method with k equals zero, and that starts at the root, and it's going to recursively go down the tree and check are we maintaining the heap invariant property, which we need. So uh, our base case is going to be that k is outside the heap size. Uh, and if so, we're just going to return true. Otherwise, get our children left and right. And now we're going to make sure that k is less than uh, both our children. And if that's not the case, return false. And if we ever return false, because we have an AND statement when we're recursing right here, um, that, that gets propagated throughout the recursion and this whole method will return false. Otherwise, if everything returns true and hits the base case, then we know for sure it's in the minimum heap. Okay, these last few methods are uh, just map helper methods, so um, things to add things into the map, uh, things, to, how to remove elements from the map, and so on. And what I'm doing here is I'm using a tree set to uh, add and remove elements because I know the tree set implementation in Java is a balanced binary search tree, so all operations on tree sets are logarithmic. 
um, which is really nice. So, so you guys can have a look at those in more detail. It just uh, gets values, removes values, and lastly, uh, do a map swap. So yeah, it swaps uh, values in the heap, or in the map rather. So you guys can have a look at those in more detail. Um, but I pretty much covered everything about the priority queue. So if something's unclear, just drop a comment and I'll get back to you as soon as possible. But, but that's the heap, uh, sorry, the binary heap implementation uh, of a priority queue. Remember that the source code is on my uh, GitHub repo, so you can have a look at that. Um, so guys, thank you for watching, and I'll catch you next time.